What are we doing in lecture after the final project starts? In lecture after final project starts, I'll talk about whatever you want to talk about. Uh, a few groups are doing music synthesis. I can talk about music synthesis. Uh, I can talk about speech compression, uh, various other things. I, I think I probably ought to do a, a lecture on um, spectacular safety failures and embedded uh, programming. Have you all, you all heard about the Therac 5 disaster in 3400? Is that true? Oh, I haven't heard about that. Did you, have you heard about the uh, Arian 5 fiasco? No. And you all know about, about software problems in Toyotas. And, and so there's lots of examples of, of embedded programming gone bad. But probably none quite as spectacular as Therac 25. So I'll talk about that um, for one lecture. It's the, it's the time of year when, when uh, I'll talk about uh, whatever you want to hear about. And if, and if the decision is that nobody wants to hear about anything more, we'll spend the rest of the time in lab. So lectures will be, lectures will be, la lecture time will become lab time. Probably within a week or two after the beginning of final projects. So... I did, uh, I got a couple of questions. One is, uh, and I took the hand-drawn image and, and ran it through cam scanner and put it up on the web. Woo! Um, sooner or later I'll, I'll figure out how to use Visio, but uh, one of the questions was, we're using, we're, we're taking a compare circuit, a comparator circuit to square up a sensor running into an input capture and what's coming out of here out of the comparator is a pulse frequency code then we're converting the period into of the of the timer capture into some sort of uh, RPM and what I apparently didn't make too clear is that we are then we want to output a voltage to the scope which is proportional to the input capture frequency. So we're outputting a voltage, not a pulse train. We're outputting a frequent, uh, a voltage which is proportional to the, to the current, the slightly low passed PWM representing the, the current RPM. And we want to do this because I don't know about you but I have trouble converting this waveform into a step function. So what we're going to do is to the low pass the low pass filter on the output then converts the RPM into a approximate voltage. Uh, so that you can treat the RPM and the control variable C of T, which is coming out of the other PWM channel, as continuous variables, uh, continuous voltages. It's, it's easier to debug it, it's easier to interpret it. Are there any more questions about this? About the Lab 4 setup? One week from today, we start final projects. So, the lab will be open this afternoon. And of course, it's open tonight. It'll be open tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow night, Friday afternoon. And I think there's plenty to do to get this running, mostly on the hardware side. Mostly, this is a hardware project. But if there's no questions, I'd like to talk a little bit about running the, the PIC standalone. For final projects, 
you can use a micro stick you can use the micro stick development system <clears throat> but if you do that you're limited number one you can't keep it you have to take apart your final project and give it back to me if you build your own standalone pick 32 system you keep it so so porting the pick 32 onto a solder board or even a whiteboard, a solderless board, uh, will allow you to, to keep the, the PIC-32 and the associated circuitry. Secondly, if for any reason in your final project you need more than one PIC-32, you must build a board because you're only allowed one micro stick. This is explicitly to force people to solder to build stuff. So I want to talk a little bit about this process of, of building a standalone system. It's really very easy for the PIC-32. And, but again, any questions about this slightly uh, obsessive uh, image for for lab four process of motor it's closed loop the motor is both the input and the output it's getting PWM output remember that the output PWM representing C of T has to go to two places it has to go to the scope so you can see it and the raw not the low pass version but the raw PWM has to be fed back to the opto to drive the motor driver So what do you need to do to make a PIC-32? There's no, que no questions about Lab 4? Any lingering questions on Lab 3? So long ago. So what do you need to do to make a PIC-32 standalone? Far as I can tell, you got to drive pin 1. That's MCLR. That's reset you got to drive pin one high with a oh maybe a 10k resistor or so here and then you need to have a reset switch that pulls the pin to ground so that you can reset and restart the CPU <clears throat> this pin will also be connected to the programmer One aspect of this is that you could no longer use the micro stick for programming. You have to use a external programmer of which we have a bunch. Uh, the programmer is a, a really pretty red box that you plug into your target system, you program it, you disconnect it. And now your system runs completely standalone. You have to supply VDD on pin 28 and on pin 13. And I'm going to draw these separately, both of them, because each one of them needs a capacitor to the ground whose leads are rather short. Pin 13 is down here and 28 is up here. Each one of them should have a capacitor next to the pin. And each one of these capacitors should be about 0.1 microfarad and they should both be disk ceramics because they're fast. <clears throat> VSS has to be fed into separately pins 8, 19, and 27. So VSS is going to be fed into three pins and you'll notice 
<clears throat> 27 is next to 28. So if we look at the actual package layout, pin 27, 28, you want to put a capacitor between these pins absolutely as close to the pins as you can. Not a centimeter away, as close to the pins as possible. <clears throat> Pin 20, oddly enough, requires a capacitance to ground. And this should be about 10 microfarad. So this is a, this is not a disc ceramic. This is a, an electrolytic and it's polarized. You have to pay attention to the polarization. So that would be uh, pin 20. Oh, but that's kind of handy because VSS happens to be on pin 19, so there's an obvious place to ground pin 20 right next to it. Then you have to have pin 4 go to a programmer pin, PGO, and pin 5 go to another programmer pin, PGC. And the programmer header then is a six pin connector which Microchip calls its ICSP in circuit something programmer. Pin 1 goes to MCLR. Pin 2 goes to, pin 2 produces, produces 3.3 volts. You do one of two things. If the system is standalone, you can, you can power it from the programmer as long as the programmer is plugged in. If the system has its own power supply, you don't connect that wire. So this will probably be a no connect. Pin 3 is ground, which obviously has to be shared. Pin 4 is PGO. And pin 5 is PGC. And pin 6 is no connect. <coughs> That's all it takes to get the system to boot. It's a very simple layout. Three capacitors, one pull-up resistor. That looks a lot like 10 to the 12th, but it's not. Should be, say, 10K. And I thoughtfully put together a chunk of references down here. Pick 32 standalone information. So let's look at the Pick Kit user's manual. If you're going to do a standalone, you're probably going to want to read the Pick Kit 3 user's manual, which hopefully explains how to use the programmer. And in particular, you're going to want to look at how you set up the, the programmer and get it connected to the, to the uh, MP Lab X. And, ah, yes, there it is. The picture of the, of the, the programmer. This end has a, a single inline header socket. What a lot of people did last year was to use five of the jumper cables to plug into the header socket and then plug those five jumper cables into the, into the board. There's a USB connection, so it's fairly easy to, to set up. But you should read the manual. Let's look at Tamid's setup. So this is what Tamid built when he was working on this. Hmm. 
contrast is not very good here. So there's five jumpers going from the pick kit up to reset four, five, and someplace ground. And he was using VCC off of the pick kit here. <clears throat> but you can see there's virtually nothing else on the board. There's the, there's the pull-up resistor for the, for the ground line. There's the big capacitor on pin 20. There's one of the bypass capacitors there. I would put it closer to the CPU. And that's all he put on the board and it booted. So building a standalone system is really very straightforward. Programmer works the same way as the microstick. You can use it from MP Lab. You may have to change the target in the in the project config, but nothing more than that. And that those directions are also in the user's manual. <clears throat> so you could build a standalone system on a piece of perf board that was probably two pins longer than 200, two, two tenths of an inch longer than the CPU itself if you wanted to build a very small target system to put into whatever you want to build. Any questions on this? It is the most straightforward system to boot I've ever seen. You, they, they, they make them. You can you can buy 28 pin surface mount in SOIC which is still solderable by human beings without a microscope. Uh, <clears throat> if you go to the TQ package, I don't know that you can solder it or not, but uh, it's fairly easy to get a carrier from Adafruit, I probably have some, that take 28 pin SOIC and convert it to 28 pin PDIP for testing. SOIC means small outline integrated circuit. It happens to be half the dimension of a PDIP. So it's half the length, half the width, and therefore half of the, of the pin pitch. So instead of a tenth of an inch, it's 0.05 inches pin pitch. That's easy to solder. I use a microscope. You probably wouldn't have to. <clears throat> you go half that again and you get and you get down to TSSOP size thin something uh, something package and in that case it's half again now we're down to 0 0.025 inches that is also fairly easy because the finest, the finest tip on the soldering irons I have is 0.02 inches. So you have five thousandths of an inch clearance between pins when you put the soldering iron down on the pin. That's enough as long as your hands don't shake. Don't drink coffee before you solder TSSOP. Although it turns out, interestingly enough, you can practice in, you drink coffee and you can practice holding your hands still and you can keep yourself from shaking if you practice. You got to want to do that. I mean, it's the kind of thing. <clears throat> but, but when I was a graduate student trying to stay awake and simultaneously do dissections, uh, I learned to hold my hands still in the presence of caffeine. It only took, I you know, three years. But, but <laughs> it seemed like it was worth it at the time. Um, Don't drink coffee if you're going to solder. So, there's some general information. There's lots of sites that talk about bringing up minimum systems. Ah, yes. There, there, this, is, the, this site brings up a couple of things. One is 
on our package because there is a USB fizz chip, a fizz built into the CPU. So you can run USB directly out of the pins of the, of the CPU. There is a VBUS and a VBUS monitor pin which has to be connected to VDD also. So pins 23 and 15 need to be connected to VDD. Yeah, they, they're saying four and a half K, it doesn't matter. It's got, there's, this, this resistor has to be above a certain size because the programmer, pin one on the programmer, has to be able to pull this pin low. And if the resistor here is too small, the programmer can't generate enough current to pull the pin low. So, so four and a half K, 10 K, anything in that region is fine. Any questions on this? And if you, there's, uh, and for redundancy, I linked up this one also. Oh boy, that's a terribly formatted page. Lovely. Oh, but it does, it does show a, sur a, a, a solder board version with, with this big capacitor bent over against the board, a disc ceramic here, Probably a disc ceramic there and not much else around the CPU. If you're going to actually use USB for anything, then you have to supply the CPU with an external crystal because the inter internal crystal is not accurate enough. So you have to supply it, and I, you'll have to look up what the value is. I believe it's got to be an 8 megahertz crystal but it might be 12. <clears throat> so you possibly, for a target system, will want to put a crystal on to two of the pins. I believe it's 11 and 12. And there's an internal crystal driver on the chip, uh, inverter gate, high, high gain inverter. But probably for most things in this lab, you won't bother. If you decide to run the system off an external resonator, external oscillator, then I doubt if you can make it boot on a solderless board because solderless boards have very poor high frequency characteristics. If you do that, you will probably have to put it on a solder board. Minimal pick circuit. Oh, this is the, uh, this is, looks like it's actually the, uh, the company line here. Oh, and it's got a, it's got a schematic, but it's not visible on, on the screen here, so we'll ignore that. One thing you will need for all but the most trivial circuits is a voltage regulator and I have a bunch of these <clears throat> three volt linear regulators these are MCP microchip 1702 low dropout analog regulators so they'll take any voltage from 3.8 less than or equal to VN, less than or equal to 14 volts. And they'll convert it to an output of 3.3. So the output is 3.3. The input is anything you want. However, for stability, the regulator must have around one microfarad disc ceramic on the input and about 10 microfarads of, of uh, 
sorry, the data sheet says one microfarad of capacitance on the output. So broad input, fixed output. That means you could run this off of three AA cells with a regulator. You could run it off of other battery sources also. You could run it off of a 9 volt battery. You'd be dissipating a lot of excess power off of a 9 volt battery. You may find that if, you're, if you care about power management, if you actually care about the length of time the batteries last, you may want to go not use this regulator but buy your own, through me, buy your own DC to DC level shifters, your own uh, buck voltage converter. But these are in the lab, we stock them, they're easy. <clears throat> The CPU should boot just fine from a 3.3 volt lithium ion button battery. You can get them in rather small sizes, typically a centimeter in diameter and two millimeters thick. 3.3 volts, 100 milliamp hours. You can calculate how long that will run the CPU at full speed, three hours. But if you want to make something small, if you want to make a wristwatch, for instance, then you're going to have to figure out how to make that battery last longer. And the way you're going to do that is to not run the CPU all the time. You're going to want to be able to put it to sleep and wake it up again. <clears throat> so once you go to battery power on, on a standalone system, you're probably going to want to figure out how to do power management on the chip. And I could do a lecture on that if, if, if people care. Could you do that? Okay. You're going to force me to actually like read. I I know a lot about power management on, at, on AVR, but not much on this chip yet because I've only used it for a year. Um, as always, let me put that back up. As always, if you use the regulator, read the data sheet. Don't ever use an integrated circuit without reading the data sheet you'll waste so much time. Do any of you intend to use I2C peripherals? You ever used them before, Peter? Yeah. They're quirky. Uh, my rule of thumb is that if you use an I2C peripheral, give yourself a week of time to fiddle with it before it works. And I'll probably, I'll try and do a lecture on I2C also. Because there's a bunch of funny stuff. SPI is extremely simple compared to I2C. So, <clears throat> one of the many things we haven't done yet for updating the course to a new CPU is to come up with a standard target board for students to build. It probably will not be done for this year, but if somebody lays out a nice circuit board for that, that I think would be useful for the course, then uh, um, we might be able to cover the circuit board construction from the course budget. Let me remind you, if you go to someplace like ExpressPCB.com, you can get three 2.5 by 3.5 inch circuit boards for about $60. Let's say that you used one half of one of those for your final project. Then that would be $10 on the budget. 
So you can afford in this project to do a pre PCB board. But if you're going to do that, you better be designing it now. Start laying it out now. Yes. If you build your own, you mean sloshing it with ferric chloride? Use the mill. <clears throat> so I would say that you, you budget that at the cost of the raw materials. The, the board itself, which is pennies, plus uh, the wear time on the, on the bit which is you get five meters of travel for every bit on that machine I believe so you can estimate how much of a bit you're using up I would guess that it's going to be a very small amount of money yes Cornell Makers Club has a PCB mill <coughs> you can get access to it by joining the club however Express PCB has a turnaround time of about three days. You could get, if you can put a CPU plus peripherals on half of a board or one board, you can afford to do it. So, does anybody foresee building circuit boards? Has anybody given it the slightest bit of thought? So, the, the you, because now is the time. You need to talk to me like now if you're gonna if you're gonna build a circuit board. I've got a bunch of ideas about that. Two or three groups in their in their in their proposals said they're gonna hook electrodes to themselves. You cannot do that until you talk to me. You will fail a course if you don't talk to me before you hooked electrodes to yourself. I have serious safety issues I want to talk about. So tell your friends. You cannot do that unless you talk to me. That's any electrode. Galvanic skin response, ECG, and particularly EEG. If anybody's going to do that. Does anybody do EEG? It's very difficult. Seen it done. It's difficult. So what else about uh, standalone? We have port expanders. If somebody wants to hook a port expander onto this, onto this minimum system, it's easy enough to do. You might want to decide how you're going to lay out the, the port expander to take advantage of, uh, to minimize wiring, to take advantage of the geometry of the chips. But there's going to be three connections between the CPU and the port expander because it's an SPI port expander. You can also buy I2C port expanders. I don't have those. You can buy them. They're about uh, almost two orders of magnitude slower than the SPI, but on the other hand, they're easy to expand. So if you need 30 port expanders, you could do that yeah, on I2C, but not on SPI. In general, when you specify a chip to buy, I, I, I erase this, you have to look at the package we can solder TSSOP, SOIC, PDIP, uh, SOT23 looks hard but it's easy the leads, uh, the whole package is three by three millimeters and the leads are either 0.7 millimeters or one millimeter apart. That's easy. Where it gets hard is if the pitch of the, of the, of the leads is below about 
uh, 0.02 inches, so call it uh, um, 0.6 to 0.7 millimeters. Something in there below that is where it starts getting quite difficult to do with hand tools. Last year, people bought microphones that had no leads on them. They were the cheapest, tiniest microphones you ever saw. They were about, oh, I don't know, the size of the tip of the, of the audio plug. They had two leads. They were solder pads on the bottom only. So the only way to solder those was to squirt solder paste on the solder lands, put the microphone on top of the solder paste, and then put it in your toaster oven for, for several minutes, and then you throw away the toaster oven because it's now lead contaminated. And I've seen people actually do this on an aluminum plate on their stove. But, so, so, it works, but it's, it's difficult. So, look at the packages that you're ordering. Don't go for the cheapest, because quite often the cheapest is leadless, and you cannot solder it. So, if you want to guess about packages that are useful, come talk to me. Uh, I have carriers for reasonable size SOIC and some TSSOP and some SOT23. I think I have sixes and eights. Uh, and so, we have a lot of the parts for this, but if you're going to order some weird integrated circuit, come talk before you order it. Because I don't actually check the packages when I order, I just order it. And if I order it and you don't use it, that's real money, you've got to budget it anyway. What else? Oh, I thought I should show you a few projects that did standalone systems so that you can see some actual actual examples. Uh Number 27, Balancing Robot. It's a really nice project. Uh, it, it, it worked quite well, but you can see down in the center of that is a, uh, is a PIC-32 on a whiteboard along with uh, Opto for the motors, a TFT screen for debugging, and most interestingly in this case, the way you tune the PID parameters, which you could do in Lab 4, by the way, well, the way they did the PID parameters here was instead of bringing them out to a console and typing in PID parameters, there's just three trim pots over here that set the PID parameters. And that way you could have the thing balancing and trim the, and trim the PID at the same time. Quite a little coordination, but not bad. So they completely got it working uh, standalone. Let's see. Uh, there was a smartwatch. This is one of the TAs. Build a, a watch. And in this case, he produced his own circuit board which used SOIC, so that's a SOIC, a 28 pin SOIC outline there, SOIC outline, with a cutout for, for the SD card data logger and uh, a LiPo battery charger. <clears throat> Uh, 
And, you know, what would life be without laser tags? So, this, requ this project required three, uh, three picks. One for the base station, which in this case was the, the micro stick, and then these uh, pistols uh, lovingly carved out of uh, foam core. <clears throat> uh, each one of which carried a circuit board with the the pick and uh, uh, some infrared drivers and uh, and oh by the way a radio NF NRF uh, 24 radio on each of the guns and on the base station so that the base station could tell when a hit occurred and when a when a shot occurred and log who was shooting who and what was happening. And so these are solder board versions of the uh, system. We have solder boards in lab. We have a couple of different kinds of uh, sizes of solder board. I try and, try and keep them in stock. They're budgeted. You can figure out where they are from the budget page what they're worth. But they're cheaper than whiteboards. Again, whiteboards are, 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 are budge budgeted high because I want you to solder. And one way to do that is to make it monetarily worth your while. If you want to be within budget with lots of boards, you're going to have to solder. That's probably enough. Any questions on the standalone stuff? It's easy. Don't be afraid. We've got programmers. Tom is a wonderful resource. He's done this, so he can help you set up the so, uh, the standalone stuff if you need it. Who needs more than one CPU for their project? Nobody. No radio links. No communications anywhere. Wow. Do whatever you want to do. But if you use the micro stick, you have to give them back to me. So you have to take apart your final project. Okay. Um, any other final project questions at this point? First parts order will be Monday. 0800. <clears throat> Mail that comes in after that will be delayed a week. The format will be the vendor, not a, not a web link. The name of the vendor, the part number, and this should be the vendor's part number, not the manufacturer's part number. So for DigiKey, every, each and every part number ends in ND. If it doesn't end in ND and it's from DigiKey, it's wrong. And then the quantity. I start at the top of the list. I go to the bottom of the list. When I hit $20, I stop. If it happens to be in the middle of a quantity, I order up to that number and I stop. If it's not in this format, I throw away the mail. So, I'll actually warn you the first time. <clears throat> but, because there's a, quite often a large number of these, I have to have it almost automated so I don't have to think too much. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to write you back and say, did you really want to buy the leadless part? Did you really want to buy this part that works at 450 volts? Uh,
let's go to the lab. Be in lab all afternoon if there's any questions. If you want to, if you want to start laying out a print circuit board, I have the software is installed. Yes. Can I ask a slightly off topic question? Sure. What's the deal with these Samsung phones exploding? The deal with the Samsung, I, you know, it doesn't seem to be the battery. I'm guessing it's embedded software. I'm guessing it's the, the charge algorithm is bad, but I don't know. Because they replaced the batteries and the new the replacement phones also blew up. That suggests a system problem. Anybody heard anything about that? I think the first time around they had the geometry wrong and they were pressing on the battery in the phone. Oh, it was a mechanical problem. Uh, well, I, they blamed it on the battery supplier and then they said it's because we're pressing on the battery. So I'm not really sure uh -huh. that uh -huh. so, time, I think it was a different problem So it was not correlated. It was just a different problem. Bad cool. testing. Okay. Nah, I don't know then. That's, uh, they're taking a three billion dollar uh, hit to withdraw the product plus the lost revenue from the product. My guess is somebody's going to lose their job. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> yeah. <laughs>